organizations with different approaches um, working together within the same organization in the same harmony as we see in the natural world. So to answer some of those questions, I'm going to talk today about OASPA and who our members are, about the activities we do to further our mission more broadly, and I'm also going to talk a bit about the open access landscape. I think telling the OASPA story really is in itself a good way to get a sense of the journey that open access publishing has been on. So if we go right back to the beginning, why was OASPA established? OASPA was initially formed by 10 organisations. They didn't all have the same approach. There was a mixture of scholar led and professional publishers like PLOS, Hindari, Copernicus, and in fact, SAGE was involved in there as well. So there has been mixed model representation from the beginning. And they were looking at exploring this new open access model and between them were able to come up with some shared values to set some standards for open access publishing. The original focus was on STM journals. And as the organization began to grow, the member review process became critical and firm criteria for membership were developed. It wasn't long before open access books were added to the scope and hence arts, humanities and social science disciplines were included as well. And more non-publishing organisations joined. So these were organisations providing services in open access or libraries hosting journals, but not being editorially responsible for those, for example. So this is the original mission of OASPA, the mission and purpose. The mission of OASPA is to support and represent the interests of open access journal publishers globally in all scientific, technical and scholarly disciplines. And uh, then it goes into uh, the, the ways that that would be done. But the mission was very simple. It was to represent parties with a specific interest in advancing this new model of publishing. So these were the areas, the main areas, and, and really since OASPA was founded, a lot of focus went on those first two, exchanging information and setting standards. So if we look back at the first couple of OASPA conferences, so we're going back to 2009, they really spoke to how important this was. Topics were things like how to handle APCs, uh, PKP was introducing its open source publishing platform, university libraries were developing their own open access publishing solutions, the leading open access publishers at the time, so this is PLOS and Biomed Central, were experimenting with institutional uh, membership and then subscription publishers started to add fully open access titles and hybrid journals. So the conference uh, also gave a way for OASPA to introduce these new models. Innovation in open access publishing isn't something OASPA can necessarily do itself as an organisation, but we have been able to highlight interesting models that have developed within our membership. So in the early days, one of the persistent arguments against open access was that there wasn't the same level of editorial control. So we wanted to make sure that we knew what publishers were doing. And our membership application process is quite intensive. Uh, we spend a lot of time digging into publications and looking at the information presented on a publisher's website to understand the processes that they're using and make sure that they're accurately described. Over the course of my time with OASPA, I've been heavily involved in that process and working with the membership committee. Less than 5% of the applications we've received for membership have been accepted. We do, though, we do work with publishers that we feel are well-intentioned and need some guidance on areas to improve if we think they're, they're nearly there. And we do also regularly review and add to the criteria as things consistently uh, change in um, publishing quickly. But we don't bend the rules for anyone. It's the same criteria for all. The bottom line really is that we aren't prescriptive about the method of open access if it adheres to the main standards. What we do expect is that publishers are transparent about what they're doing, about what they're charging, what an author can expect for that, and to have that information be easy to find. So um, anyone who wants to know more about our membership criteria and our process can find uh, this information on our website and I'm happy to answer questions about that as well, but I'm assuming these slides will be shared so the, the link is in there for you. This is the code of conduct that our members 
um, are expected to adhere to. The commitment to the standards is an ongoing requirement. You'll see here there's a recognised recognize description of open access, uh, but this has also evolved and we understand that there are sometimes um, needs for exceptions. We also have an investigation process and we do occasionally receive external complaints about members that we do investigate. The process is also described on our website. This has resulted in a couple of occasions where members have either had to be placed on review or have been removed from the organisation. We've also worked on initiatives with other organisations to encourage similar standards outside of OASPA. You might be familiar with these. So the first there, Think, Check, Submit. Uh, this is a, a checklist that we put together with a number of other organisations working in this space. It's intended as a guide to researchers in making their own assessments about places they can trust to publish their research instead of relying on black or white lists. And I know that the library community also finds this a useful resource. We've recently added a checklist for books and additional things to help an evaluation of the publisher level rather than the journal level. We also created a joint principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing. So this isn't just for open access. Uh, we've um, worked on this with COPE, with the DOAJ and the World Association of Medical Editors. And we've had broad international interest in both of these collaborative um, produced guides. Um, they've been translated. Think, Check, Submit is available in 41 languages now and the um, principles of best practice in 18 languages and there's a link to that on our website as well. So these kind of standards in publishing are not only important for our members, we see this as something that we can help him uh, with much broadly, more broadly. So 2018 was the 10 year milestone for OASPA since it was founded and we use this as a marker point to look back at the progress that we'd made in open access and re-examine the mission. The board and I have done a lot of strategizing over the past two years and we weren't in the same place as we started. In the beginning we were making the case for open access and regularly defending against concerns that standards weren't as high. Ten years on and open access was accepted as a mainstream model of publication and OASPA had grown a lot as an organisation. With a diverse membership, there are pulls in different directions and there are different expectations from different membership categories. We needed to look at what we now represented in order to work out where we would go next. So this is what you'll now find on our website. And just to pick out a couple of things from this, um, representing a community of scholarly publishers and related organisations, OASPA is committed to developing and disseminating solutions that advance open access, preserve the integrity of scholarship and promote best practice. And one of the core goals of OASPA is to support the transition to a world in which open access becomes the predominant model of publication for scholarly outputs. So here the, uh, you can see the areas that we focus on. I'm not going to read all of this out. This is also on our, on our website online. But what has changed for us uh, essentially at OASPA? So some of the things are the same. Uh, setting standards and promoting innovation. We've settled on leadership instead of advocacy, which better reflects where we are now. But that last point of supporting a healthy and diverse OA market is really important. Um, flick back, we said in the mission statement that one of the core goals of OASPA is to help ensure a diverse, vibrant and healthy open access market that supports a wide variety of innovative solutions and business models. Whether or not you, you like the word market uh, to describe the publishing landscape, it has changed a lot. There's a much greater complexity of business models. It was felt back at the beginning of our ASPA story that APCs were the way to go and that moving to an open access model would increase transparency and value for money and that the barrier to entry would be lowered and that some of the problems in the subscription system would go away. Obviously, this hasn't been the case. People didn't see hybrid coming either, which has added a new set of problems. 
And now we can see that APCs are not perfect and are adding to the inequity in the system, not just in lower and middle income countries, but also, as you're well aware, causing budgeting problems depending on the variable nature of institutional funding and whether an institution is research intensive or not. So what else have we been grappling with? Well, initially, as I mentioned, with the first quite straightforward mission, OASPA's role was to represent open access publishers in the same space. As time has gone on, there are a lot of different models and also, crucially, different motivations for open access publishing. We've had fun trying to work on unified statements on some issues. It's not easy to make a statement on something like Plan S when you have this variety of organisations with an interest in open access. But my view is that diversity is a real strength. We have all of these different perspectives, but with a shared goal to advance open access and for that to be the predominant model of publication. And the diversity within OASPA reflects the diversity that exists in reality. It would be easier, of course, to have a small group of organisations that all agree, but that's not how you bring people along with you and affect change that's going to work for everyone. In that situation, you're just talking within a bubble of people that think the same way that you do. And these are really complicated problems that can't be fixed overnight. We can't just flip everything. So the more people we can include and the more views we can listen to, then so much the better. So where are we now? We've got now 147 members of very diverse types. This slide explains the different groupings. We've got scholar publishers. These are individual journals that are run by uh, academics through volunteer effort. Professional publishers. These have at least one paid staff member and they range from very small publishers to some of the biggest. Uh, supporting services and infrastructure. We split this out into commercial, non-commercial, and this is a mix of all different types of organisations with an interest in open access that aren't doing publishing. So there's in also included in there a number of institutional libraries supporting open access publishing activities as well. Uh, this is a slide which shows our membership breakdown, um, in case you're interested in the, the kind of publishers we're representing by, by type. So you can see here that the scholar publishers, so that's those volunteer-led journals, they actually make up the biggest membership category and then the smallest professional publishers. So I, I group these together in the second chart. You can see they make up almost 60% of our members and actually the supporting services and infrastructure are the next largest group. So this is not just uh, an organisation of uh, sort of professional and, and commercial publishers. Um, and you might be interested to know as well that 75% of our publisher members are fully open access and almost half of them don't charge any kind of fee. This next chart I included to show you the, um, the output from our members. So the, the yellow line on that chart is, the, uh, is all types of open access uh, in fully open access and hybrid journals, all, all kinds of licenses combined. The blue line underneath it is uh, CC by content in fully open access journals. So uh, this is to illustrate that is the, the vast majority of the content published by OASPA members. And I collect this data annually. I'm looking to also include books in it this year. Most of the things that we do actually are to involve anyone with an interest in open access publishing. We've hosted 12 conferences on open access so far. Recent topics have included community governed infrastructure, open access books is always on the, the schedule, emerging research into open access, research culture and also considerations about global inequity. We'll be making an announcement about our 2020 event shortly. We've been busy the past few weeks figuring out what we're going to do this year, but ours takes place in September, so we have a little longer than you guys to, to figure it out. We also run a webinar series. We started these just for members, but we decided a couple of years ago to open them up for much, uh, open them up wider for everybody to benefit. And they're all freely available on our website on a range of topics relating to open scholarship and other open access publishing issues. 
more and more we're trying to use the conference of the webinars to tackle some of those elephant in the room topics related to scholarly communication and to give a respectful and inclusive space for a healthy debate and for different organizations to convene and discuss those issues and the and the major shared challenges that we have OASP has always had an international outlook. We see this in our membership and our events. So we're going to take a look now at what's happening in the open access publishing world. I'm going to talk a bit about trends in open access publishing and also recent global policy developments. This is a slightly fuzzy diagram here, so I, I hope you can see it okay. This is from a Delta Think report looking at trends over the past few years and estimated for the near future. And the headlines here really are the proportion of papers from countries in the Asia Pacific region is increasing. Western Europe is flatlining overall. North America is decreasing and especially the proportion of open access, which is interesting. Other regions are steadily increasing, but in much smaller amounts of articles. And you can clearly see here where the major producers of scholarly outputs are. This is a comparison of, oh, sorry, I should say, I have included the, uh, the sources for this information. There are some interesting reports that, um, that go into more detail about this. If you want to look those up, the links are there. Um, yeah, so this is um, the comparison of open access article share and revenue share and this goes up to 2018. This is actually the latest data that I could get on this complete 29 day, 2019 data isn't available yet and getting good data on open access is just very difficult full stop. But you can see here Open access, if you compare the share and the, the revenue, this is not where the big money is, which I think is why there's a lot of frustrations around hybrid looking like an expensive route that funders don't really want to support in the long term. And we'll come on to that a bit more in, in, a, in a moment. So in 2017, the global open access market was worth around $588 million and grew to $675 million by the following year. It's expected to have grown to about $758 million for 2019. But the 15% increase between 2017 and 18 is much larger than the underlying growth of the scholarly journals market itself. Um, under 30% of global output is open access. That's excluding green and public access or bronze. And less hybrid in the future, uh, which is what we expect, will change the dynamics. Globally, the strong growth in output appears to be driven by publications in fully open access journals. And to put some of these uh, amounts in context, it's not perfect, but the last STM Association report in 2018 stated that the annual revenues generated from English language STM journal publishing were estimated at about $10 billion in 2017 within a broader STM information publishing market worth $25.7 billion. So this is a, you know, it is a very small proportion of that at the moment, and that doesn't include the, the rest of publishing outside of STM. In that same report, it also stated that about 41% of global STM revenues came from the USA, 27% from the Europe and Middle East, and 26% from Asia Pacific. So that's just something interesting to think about because the revenues by geographical region, which I showed you on the, the previous slide, doesn't match with this, with the globe, sorry, global authorship doesn't match with uh, with revenue. So this is a closer look at full OA versus hybrid and it seems that even before the effects of Plan S have fully manifested the hybrid share of output is slowing. The overall number of hybrid articles though is growing it's just that other content types are growing more quickly. There could be a number of reasons for this for example, most of the funders pushing for full open access rolled out their mandates over the last few years. But it will be interesting to track this and see what the 
effect of newly emerging strong mandates will be on hybrid open access over the next few years. So this is um, unpayable data here. Even when we look a few years ahead, the picture isn't expected to change quickly. And the headline here is that if we just continue as we are, we are decades away from OA saturation. So there's a lot of work for OASPA to do. Um, so with this graphic from Unpayable, we're finally just at 30% OA in five years time. And uh, the green and hybrid are still in the subscription system. So that's di discounting the bronze stuff, which is free to read, but without a recognized license, which doesn't meet the OASPA definition of open access. And again, I've, I've included a link there. And funder mandates may affect these trends in growth in the coming years. Every time I look at this slide, I'm reminded how frustrating all these open access colors are. It's no wonder it's difficult to get good comparative data and that everybody's confused by all these terms. Um, and just to note here that OASPA used to advocate for gold open access uh, at the beginning. It, it's actually on the first mission and that was purely meant open at the time of publication. And now gold is confused with APCs and we ourselves tend to describe our preference for fully open access. So I can only really give a snapshot in the time I've got here. I'm going to mainly focus on policy in Europe. I feel that Europe is really taking the lead on pushing towards open access. And in the past couple of years, we've seen some really strong and ambitious strategies from some countries already on open access and open science, such as the Netherlands and France, and some national funding bodies also being very supportive of open access and moving in that direction. So I'm giving UKRI as an example, as I'm based in the UK. UK Research and Innovation represents seven research councils, Innovate UK and Research England, and together they have a combined budget of seven billion pounds. They're currently carrying out a review of their open access policy. A consultation phase is in progress at the moment. There is a lot of interest in what stance they're going to take on hybrid journals in particular and how closely they'll follow Plan S, which they're a signatory of. Importantly, the new UKRI policy will include books as well as journals, which is a, a really good move to see, but it does mean there's new considerations given the disciplines that favour book publishing. The uh, European Commission, the work of the European Commission has been really significant with regards to policy on open access and open science. They work in blocks of seven years and they're currently also preparing their policy for the next block. So we'll move from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe. The European Commission has a 100 billion euro research and innovation programme and they're looking to set a policy that's robust and workable and that can stand the test of time if it's running for that, for that seven year period. So there's a balance between being overly ambitious but also becoming outdated during that time. Their policy is also going to be inclusive of all disciplines, so therefore will also apply to books and other long form works in arts, humanities and social sciences. So it's great to see that these policies are all moving beyond STM. Um, Plan S, I'll spend a little more time on this one. I think the emergence of Coalition S has not always been the easiest thing to follow and uh, it, it was the coming together of a group of national and private funders led at the time by the then open access envoy of the European Commission Robert Jan Smits with practical running of the activities being managed by Science Europe which is another group of funders not all of whom are members of the coalition so there's some care needed there. Plan S will come into effect in January 2021 and many of us are keen to see the real effect that a combined group of funders is going to have. Uh, Plan S is not intending to have a policy on books from the outset, but this is being looked at and will be added soon. What's interesting, I think, is that this shows a greater coordination between funding organisations than we've seen before, and it started a global discussion. Although most in Coalition S are European funders, Plan S made 
really massive waves and I have a document where I keep track of the various responses that have been made and there are so many. I think there was some confusion at the beginning because Plan S was actually an ideal vision that was presented, it was open to feedback and I think this point probably wasn't communicated well. Uh, it appeared to be set in stone so I think that's where some of the, the statements have, have come from. But as time has gone on through the consultation period, Coalition S, has, they've stuck to their principles, but have responded to feedback around the implementation. They've launched projects to dive deeper into some of those issues, such as um, publisher pricing transparency. So there's a, a pilot running at the moment to test the collaboratively devised framework. And uh, also they're looking at now at diamond open access models they could support. So that, that will be another project that they're launching shortly. There's definitely been some resistance, uh, notably from mixed model publishers and societies and to some extent the research community. Although I would say that I still feel, well, my view is many researchers remain largely uninterested in policy as long as they can get the funding that they need. So I'm sure there's lots that haven't heard of Plan S. Um, but many in this space saw the announcement of Plan S as a sign that momentum is building. Now, in the current crisis that we're in, we're at another pivotal moment. Although this is not the first pandemic facing humanity, the real and immediate need for open access and international collaboration has never been so clearly illustrated to many in the Western world. So, I'm including also the Wellcome Trust on this slide. Uh, I've included a link to their policy. They've been a leader on open access policy from the outset. Uh, from 2021, their policy will also be in line with Plan S. It's all available there for you to have a look at. But the key points are no embargoes will be allowed. Articles must be in PMC and Europe PMC at the time of publication. All articles and must be under a CCB by license to support uh, text and data mining unless agreed otherwise they, they will discuss exceptions authors must retain their copyright funding will no longer cover hybrid unless the journal is part of a transformative agreement authors must publish rapidly um, as a preprint in the case of a health emergency like now welcome funded organizations must commit to dora the san francisco declaration on research assessment and books and chapters are included in the policy except for trade books and textbooks etc so love it or hate it it takes a very clear uh, strong position now china um in february of this year the chinese government the chinese government released two policy documents and these are intended to reform the research and higher education evaluation systems in china the not notable points are uh, only a number of a limited number of researchers papers can count towards their evaluation process. At least a third of the papers must be published in domestic Chinese journals and the quantity of papers will not be used to measure performance. So this is a very important shift to a fewer but better approach and it will have an effect on the submissions to English language journals. So think back again to that slide of authorship trends. Recall that the biggest growth area was Asia Pacific and much of that is attributed to China. There will also be a cap on automatically approved spend. I think this is equivalent to just under $3,000. So there's a lot of interest from international publishers on what's happening in China in particular and how decisions being made there will affect the picture moving forwards. And uh, the US I'm going to assume, given this audience, that you are the most familiar with uh, US policy developments. We will have to see what happens with this current consultation, of course. But where not so long ago we heard uh, the comment from the OSTP of this government will not tell researchers where they have to publish their papers, obviously we now know there is a consultation going on. And again, an initial leak of the fact that the revision of the policy was being considered sparked a number of statements in favour and against filling up my uh, tracking document. So that's an interesting one to watch too. So why get involved in policy? Because there is an awful lot to keep track of in this space, but it's clear that funder policies are playing a significant role in the open access landscape. And with the current pandemic now 
affecting US and Europe uh, directly. It's a sad fact that it served as a bigger wake up call to some policymakers than previous health emergencies and has highlighted why they need access to as much research as possible. I just wanted to include this slide here to illustrate the effectiveness of open access policy and, and the benefits when compliance is followed up on. So welcome, as I mentioned to you, has a very strong policy, but they also work hard to monitor compliance. And you can see the impact of that here. And the NIH is also doing a good job of this. And I've included a link to the, the article in Nature where I got this um, image from, if you want to have a deeper look. From what I've heard talking to the UK library community, a lot of their time and effort is focused on ensuring compliance. And it doesn't leave so much time for communicating the benefits of open access. Funders and policymakers are really driving the change in open access right now, I think. And the stick is proving to be a more effective or perhaps quicker way than the carrot approach has been. But it, it doesn't mean, of course, that we can't combine the two. We had a good opening panel at the OASPA conference last year, and I've included the link to that here as well. There's a, a very open discussion um, on funding approaches between funders. So policy is something I've been focused on quite a bit over the past couple of years since becoming executive director of OASPA. And although we have a very active board, I think it helps for our organization to have a neutral person in discussions rather than somebody who's based at a particular publisher, although they are good at, at wearing more than one hat. But I think this is where I've been able to lead OASPA into a new phase of being more directly engaged in, in policy. You don't need to worry on this slide about the amount of money included in these little rectangles. This is um, from, uh, again, the links at the bottom. This uh, is a, a website which tracks APC spend. Um, it's the Open APC Initiative. Uh, it also includes any available transformative agreement information. And it's mainly for European countries, but it's great to have a play around with. What I wanted to show you here is a visual representation of how many institutions, so if this is just uh, Europe, um, you can see the rectangles get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, this is just the UK. There's, there's tons just in the UK. And this is the same data sorted by publisher. Again, don't worry about the amounts. Uh, that, that's not the point of me including this. The point is that there are a lot of publishers here and this isn't all of them. Open access is, is growing and the central payment system is emerging as a favoured route. Uh, models are getting more complicated and different types of agreements are being made. Most of these publishers, apart from the biggest ones on the biggest rectangles on this chart, most of these can't form individual agreements with institutions and institutions can't form agreements with all publishers. The many to many relationship here is too big. And for the institutions, they're managing this process of paying per article manually often, which is a huge burden. So this brings me on to the open access switchboard. The OA switch, switchboard uh, OASPA set up as a project. We don't own this, but we're running it. We strongly believe that this needs to be an open source piece of infrastructure and needs to be developed and governed by all stakeholders. So that is the, the route that we're taking to set this up. This started from the idea that if an author wants to publish in Journal X, they need to know if this meets their funder requirements and if their institution will cover the funds. If there are multi-author papers with different institutions or different funders, there needs to be a decision on who picks up the bill. The OA switchboard will be a messaging system where pre-approved criteria mean that these decisions can be made automatically and it will provide a reporting mechanism for institutions and funders in real time on actual spend and committed funds. It will run to the point of invoicing but will not be a payment solution. The idea is that it will integrate with the existing solutions that are out there, they will sit on top of this. And because it's all based on metadata, we have a, a an opportunity to improve that system as well. So we have a steering committee 
of funders, publishers and representatives from institutions and we have a wider multi-stakeholder advisory group supporting that work and giving uh, valuable guidance and input to shape the project. We've just signed a contract with a tech partner uh, who'll be building an MVP, which will, uh, so that's the minimum viable product. And we have organizations signed up to start a pilot uh, with that as well. So watch this space. Um, more information is available on the OA switchboard website. I've included a, a link to that there as well. And um, you can also sign up for news through the website too. So a lot of information. When I take a step back, what are all the key things here? Does it matter how, how we increase open access? Well, I think it does. Are we okay? with mass consolidation, just as long as research is open, that, that we get to that predominant model uh, by any means? No, I don't think we are okay with that. Think back to the image of the diversity of life back at the start. Diversity matters in every sense, even in publishing. OASPA works because it's a representation of the reality of the open access ecosystem and because we're encouraging the different viewpoints to come through. We're working to support all those within our community who have an interest in open access. And I'm mindful that a lot of our members are small, as I've demonstrated, and they need a voice and they need support to thrive. Bibliodiversity is important for the arts, humanities and social sciences. In particular, there's an even longer tail, lots of publishers with smaller numbers of outputs per publisher. And this is also the area where different languages of a regional importance um, and we should try and preserve that as much as possible. And as well as wanting global open access to articles, this is the foundation of enabling much broader open scholarship and open science activities. It's important that scholars have a range of good quality open access options in line with all those funder policies. And something that I, I haven't touched on much, but research assessment is working against open access in some cases that's why welcome have included um, dora in their policy it is important that research assessment in institutions doesn't work against the options that researchers have available to them and that is the end um, does anybody have any questions